Hi everyone, this is a video about fossil hunting in New Zealand and later in the video I'm going to talk to Dr. Nick Rollins. Uh, he wrote a really good blog post on ethical fossil hunting so he's going to come in for a chat with us. So the first thing you need to do is figure out where you're going to go fossil hunt and this book is really great for fossil hunting sites in New Zealand. It's about $40 I think but you can also get the PDF and it's got some great areas in here. Uh, it's got a map in the front, so it will show you all the areas you can go look for fossils and then a write-up of the fossils you can find in each area. And I used this book, found a site close to me, and this was my first ever fossil I found. It's a vertebra from a smallish dolphin. This book by Jocelyn Thornton is also really great. It's got a few more technical terms in it but it's got some really great sites in it and it's not just about fossils it's also about rocks and minerals so it's a great book as well then what do I take fossil hunting? so I take a bag obviously to carry the things in but in my bag there's um, this rock hammer which this one is not actually a geological hammer this is just a brick hammer from Bunnings. <laughs> you can get them on Trade Me as well. I think it's like 20 bucks or so. So all I do with this hammer is I'm not breaking open rocks. Um, like if I tried that with that penguin fossil, uh, it would have just shattered all those bones because the bones have micro fractures in them. This is mainly just for prying rocks so I can take them out from between other rocks or just flipping over the larger rocks. That's what I use them for. And obviously when you using a hammer, if you're going to try and hit something please wear safety glasses and obviously earring protection <laughs> the other main thing to do in New Zealand is you need a hat and you need sunscreen because the sun in New Zealand is harsh another great way to find sites to go fossil hunt is geotrips.org.nz and that's also from the GNS and that's got some really great areas you can visit and it also tells you how difficult it is to get to them Another really great YouTube channel is Julian Thompson's Out There Learning YouTube channel. He's got some really great knowledge about the local geology, um, also including fossils. So go have a look at his channel. It's really worth watching. I can see Nick has just joined the Zoom call, so let's go chat to Nick. Nick is a paleoecologist and science communicator at the Otago Paleogenetics Lab in the Department of Zoology at the University of Otago. He uses ancient DNA and paleontology to reconstruct past ecosystems. And you can follow Nick on Twitter at Nick underscore Rollins underscore NZ. Oh, I have a link in the video description to his Twitter profile as well as his blog. So thanks, Nick, for taking the time. It's really awesome chatting to you. Um, tell us a bit about your work there at Otago Paleogenetics Lab, if I've got that right. Uh, no, completely right. So what we do is we use paleontology and ancient DNA to reconstruct um, prehistoric ecosystems in the past. So what New Zealand was like before uh, the arrival of humans, how did the ecosystem function, what species were there, what was their diet, um, how did New Zealand's dynamic geological and climactic history uh, affect their evolution, how did they adapt to that? And we, we move right through to what were the impacts of human arrival and climate change on this ecosystem and how can we take that information and actually use it for um, species conservation and ecosystem restoration now? That's amazing. And do you still get time to go fossil hunting? Yeah, I do. I take my kids out fossil hunting. I've got a uh, six-year-old uh, six and an eight-year-old and they absolutely love it. And we've got a research program out at the 15 to 19 million year old St. Bathans um, oh, fossil yeah, yeah. site that we work with um, to Papa, the National Museum. And I take the kids mm. out there for a week at a time and they help excavate all the fossils and uh, they've developed an absolute love of paleontology. And um, oh, that's awesome. They, yeah, they absolutely love it. And what's your favorite fossil you found? Probably the favorite one is when I first went fossil hunting in Australia during my PhD. I was mm. up at. Um, uh, the the badlands north of Burra in South Australia, and I was down yeah. in one of the big erosion gullies, and it was a sixty thousand year old um yeah big Tasmanian devil uh, mandible. Oh, that's cool. Still had the teeth in it and wow. everything, <laughs> and we donated it to uh, the South Australian Museum. Why are amateur and private collectors important to paleontology? So. 
Paleontology New Zealand, um, we need to understand why um, species went extinct, how they've adapted to New Zealand's dynamic geological, climactic and human history. Um, if we're going to uh, predict uh, what's going to happen in the future in a fast changing world with with um, climate change. So there, there's a there's a key phrase in geology of the past is the key to the present, and I would argue the future. Yeah. Paleontologists in New Zealand um, are an aging workforce, and it's critically underfunded. Um, paleontologists aren't being replaced, and because we're a very coastal country, we've got lots and lots of coastline with lots of erosion. Is we can't be everywhere at once and mm. we have meagre resources. So we really rely on amateur collectors and private collectors who I'd almost say have a really good understanding of the paleontological forecast of New Zealand of what sites are where, what new discoveries have been made, where is stuff eroding, that they can make the discoveries. They ha they are very well trained. They're very, very knowledgeable. Like one of our most famous um, amateur collectors was Joan Whiffen, mm. uh, who discovered New Zealand's first dinosaur bones and was yes. writing scientific papers, and she wasn't trained. Um, so we need these amateur collectors and private collectors to make these discoveries, to work closely with uh, museums and universities to um, further paleontology and for us to be able to go okay, we can now go put our resources into this site and this site, or the, mm. the, these specimens are important, or or these ones these ones aren't. So I think if we actually f follow the rules and the ethical guidelines, is we can actually work really, really well together and actually make a whole lot of these new um, cool discoveries that have been uh, found. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's very encouraging. Uh, you know, often as a as an amateur fossil hunter, you know, you you wonder what is the viewpoint of the professionals towards the amateurs. But you know, in my dealings with professional museum staff, it's always been everyone's been really excited because at heart, everyone's in this because they love fossils and they love discovering yeah. new things and mm. they by nature curious. Yeah, no, we we definitely need to work well to. Um... Uh, together and one of the key examples is the discovery of the plesiosaur that's just been made in outback queensland that's hit yes. the media in the past week where plesiosaur fossils with heads attached in australia are as rare as hen's teeth and this discovery was made by two female farm workers who had an interest in yeah. paleontology and discovered this realized that significance and then got in contact with queensland museum and they mounted a joint excavation awesome. and then discovered this really really cool fossil and is there is there a certain uh, uh type of fossil or in instance when you should not collect fossils um you know if they i don't know in a, in a certain situations you shouldn't collect on private land so if if you are going to collect on private land you need um landowner permission um yeah. if you are going on crown owned land like department of conservation or a conservation uh, a national park or a reserve or a geological reserve like um castle point in the wire wrapper um mm. you shouldn't collect because you need a permit and you've got to have a okay. valid scientific reason to collect that you can collect on public land so riverbeds riverbanks are uh, the foreshore because that's kind of considered what you call no man's land um mm. it's a finders keepers rule there, there's caveats to that that if you can um get to a site easily if you can um pick up the fossil and put it in your bag and carry it away with you and if it's non-mechanical so mm. not are rock saws or diggers like um yeah. a, a, a rock hammer and a rock chisel is fine you can collect and take yeah. that away with you but you've also got to bear in mind that there might be local or regional council bylaws um gotcha yeah some regions will have them some regions don't so we you collect should always be assessed on a case-by-case -case, um basis and you you need to make that decision around um is this going to be washed away mm. with the next tide, like the billfish yeah, fossil yeah. that you found on the beach? Yeah. Uh, is the next rainstorm going to erode it out of a cliff and it's going to disappear um, and be lost? Or does this need a bigger ex 
excavation. And that's where you should actually um, really, especially if it's obvious it's vertebrate um, hmm. animals with a backbone, you should really start talking to the local universities and museums where the experts and the paleontologists work. Um, and speaking of those loose rocks, a question I often get asked, um, people are a little bit scared to take their fossils to the museum because they think if it's important, the museum's going to take it from them or the university is going to take it from them. Does that happen? No. So because there's this finder's keeper's rule, um, the museum can't take it from you, but the experts will know um, if it's important and if it's scientifically important and they can have discussions with you around um, donating those fossils to the museum mm. to get them into public ownership. Um, because yeah. to be able to study those fossils, to publish on those fossils, uh, they can't be in private hands. But those fossils aren't going to disappear into a storeroom and never mm. see the light of day. So um, uh, back in the 1800s and in the early 19, uh, 1900s, that would have been the case. And with museums now and research is with fossils that you find is um, scientists uh, can study these fossils uh, very often in collaboration with um, the person that found the fossil. It's important to keep up uh, uh, these ties and support the actual mm. amateur or private collectors who have found them. Um, but we'll want to do publicity on this. We'll want to set up um, exhibitions on these fossils to showcase the research that's actually been done on um the collections and everything so very yeah, yeah. rarely will they disappear into a collection never see the light of day mm. that's that's cool because i often get asked uh you know uh people have heard rumors that if they give something to the museum donate a fossil to the museum it won't be displayed it's going to go into a storeroom never see the mm. light of day again um and I've, I've mentioned before that museums only have a limited uh space that they can display fossils in and they kind of rotate things around or have yeah. specialist uh, exhibitions i know the yeah. canterbury museum had a display on all the wiper penguin and bird bones not too long ago so it does look like you know they get displayed and they get studied so yeah that's yeah. really good to hear i think that'll uh, settle a few questions that people had so thanks for that no worries. And it's a Targa Museum was doing uh revolving six month exhibitions on oh, yeah. uh, specimens in their collection that had been the subject of uh recent uh recent research. So uh, there there are ways and means that if it's not a permanent exhibition, you can actually do a, a temporary exhibition to showcase um the latest mm -hmm. and coolest discoveries. Oh, that's very cool. And also, you know, with things becoming more and more digital, uh, I know some museums are actually creating digital, um, you know, fossil collections where they 3D scan them and create, you know, almost like curated 3D uh, yeah. fossil exhibits, which is really cool. Mm. No, and that's a it's a really good way that if you can't actually get to the museum, you can actually see the, the fossils that are on display mm. um, as well. And um, I've come across a few middens, you know, mm. when I'm out fossil hunting, especially when you get to a river mouth, you know, and there's been some erosion, you often see like a midden where there's um, definite markings that's, you know, someone has used the fire to cook something. Mm. What's what's the law around middens? So with um, middens, they're an archaeological site. As regardless of whether the midden is on private land um, public land or crowned land or, or the foreshore, they're, they're completely protected. You can't collect from archaeological sites or, or middens, these prehistoric rubbish dumps, without um, an archaeological authority from Heritage mm -hmm. New Zealand and without an archaeologist present. Um, so usually you can tell a midden or archaeological site because there is an associated toolkit. You, you might see artifacts coming out. You might see burnt uh, stone or umus, the oven, the oven features, um, yeah. or the the shell middens. Um, if you've got, um, say for example, you could have mower bones eroding out of um, peat or sand dunes. Is if you're not seeing any associated archaeological toolkit um, uh, or cultural material, and you're a bit unsure, 
take a photo, take a GPS coordinate, get in touch yeah. with the scientists in the local museums, and we can make a call fairly easily. Yeah. We invariably collaborate with um, archaeologists really, really closely, and we, we can make these calls around, do we need to go in and get the material mm. before it's uh, eroded away? Often I get asked, can I send fossils out of New Zealand, and what's the law around that? There's... Uh, an act called the Protected Objects Act. So anything older than around about 1975 may be a protected object. And to determine if it's a protected object, if you want to send it out of New Zealand, you have to apply for an export permit under the Protected oh. Objects Act. Um, and when you do that application, um, it will get sent to... Uh, paleontologists at universities and at museums and we will make the call about whether this is a protected object and should stay mm -hmm. in New Zealand or whether it can be sent overseas permanently so um, the analogy I use is if you wanted to send over say a moa tarsa metatarsus from an eastern moa from the late Holocene the past 6,000 years and there are hundreds of these in museums the 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 paleontologists might go okay we have enough of these in museums it's not important um uh that can be sent out of the country permanently mm. however if it's a complete skull of the mo of a moa where there aren't many skulls available yeah. in museum collections like skulls of crested moa for example um that would no doubt be called a protected object and would not be able to leave the country um, it it doesn't mean that you would have to give up that fossil. It just means that you can't send it out of New Zealand. Mm. So um, it's not illegal to collect and own fossils in New Zealand, and um, uh, but you can't send them out of New Zealand um, without one of these permits. And the other thing to, I suppose to be aware of is there is um, a, a law that will come into effect um, potentially soon around stopping the sale of mower bones um, on yeah. sites like Trade Me. And so this is really designed around uh, what we're talking about, around ethical fossil collecting, mm. is that when you look at the mower bones or bones of extinct New Zealand birds on Trade Me, is based on the information um, that we can see the color of the bones. How are they preserved? The mm. same goes for um, skeletons and auction houses. Uh, we can invariably go, well, we think that was illegally collected. Um, yeah, yeah. Or it's not a complete skeleton. It's got two left legs, for example. Yes. Um, yeah. If they're selling shattered bone, it's from an archaeological site, which means it's collected illegally. So that's yeah, yeah. that, that law's all around designed to stop... Um, the unethical collecting of fossils um, mm. and ar archaeological material. Thanks so much for your time, Nick. I've really enjoyed talking to you and thanks so much for all that knowledge. It's been awesome getting no. it from someone with, you know, uh, a foot in the professional side and also keeping an eye on the amateur side. No worries. Anytime. Thanks so much for watching everyone. I hope you found this uh, video useful. It's a little bit different to my usual format. And thanks again, Nick, for taking the time to come chat to me and bringing such awesome knowledge to us. I'm gonna go check out this book. There's, uh, as I was paging through it, I saw a few new sites I need to go visit. So stay safe and I'll see you on the next hunt.